Well, good morning everyone and welcome once more to our service here on Donagh Free Church YouTube and Facebook pages. Uh, this is going to be the last uh, service uh, of this particular kind in that next Sunday uh, we hope to be back uh, in our church building and I've just got one or two uh, comments I need to make on that. Uh, first of all, as you will appreciate, we're going to be limited in our uh, numbers to 50. So if you want to come, if you intend to come, uh, would you please let us know by Friday at the latest. There is a booking forum on our new Donagh Free Church website page, but if you have any problem accessing that or if you're not online, you just phone myself or Al or any of the elders, but make sure that you do that if possible uh, by Friday. At the same time, we're going to uh, live stream the service for those who don't feel uh, or are not able uh, to attend uh, in person and uh, afterwards the sermon uh, will continue to be available on the website and on the YouTube page. In addition to that we're going to continue with our Sunday evening services on Zoom. Uh, tonight at six o'clock we're going to be looking at Ephesians 5 1 to 21 and we'll be looking at what it means to live as children of light. And then tomorrow morning, Monday, the Bible reading group will continue as usual. And the ladies Bible study online on Tuesday evening. And then our midweek meeting on Wednesday with prayer and Bible reading and reflection will be at the usual time of half past seven. So I hope that you'll continue to enjoy the fellowship either online or if possible with us in person and we look forward to God enabling us to meet together again. I know that many of you have been longing for the day and although we have to tread carefully we have sought to ensure that everything is prepared and we look forward to meeting face to face or at least mask to mask next Sunday morning. Secure 
Hello, I wanted to send you a warm welcome from Stony Point Church in Richmond, Virginia. My name is Zach Collins, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we truly cannot wait until we're able to be back together with you guys, uh, to worship with you, uh, to spend some time together, but also uh, serve the King of Kings together in his kingdom building there in the Highlands. So we are hopeful for that day to come sooner rather than later. Well, today as we come to prayer, I'm going to use a couple of texts to stimulate our prayer. So if you'd like to take a moment to turn to these passages, I'll be looking at Psalm 8 and also the end of Ephesians 4. But let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We praise you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, we thank you that you are a majestic God. We say with the psalmist, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. And especially, Lord, in this season, as we look up to the heavens that declare your handiwork, as we see the beauty of autumn, the changing of colors, and the beauty that surrounds us, Lord, it points to your glory, that you are a God that is not of us not like us. You are a God that is infinite, a God that we cannot fully understand. And we praise you for that fact, Father, because it, if it weren't true, you would be just like us. And why can we worship a God, or how can we worship a God that is just like us? So Lord, we praise you that you are set apart. But Lord, we also praise you with that same breath that you are a God that made yourself known to us through your word and through the person and work of Jesus Christ, who came down here to live among us for a while, put on flesh, setting aside the glory of heaven. Lord, we praise you for that fact. But Lord, again, we thank you that as we look to the heavens and we see the work of your fingers, it causes us to ask this question, who are we that you are mindful of us, a glorious God that thinks of us? Lord, may that truth encourage us. May that truth mold our identities, mold who we are, and mold the way that we look at other people as well. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that cares for us, that thinks of us, in ways that we cannot even imagine. Thank you, Lord, that you also put under our dominion as caretakers of your creation, this world. Help us to take that responsibility heavily. Help us to remember the calling that we have to care for and to redeem not just human beings, but also this whole world as you are doing that as a part of your kingdom building here on earth. Lord, we praise you and help us to remember our calling to that end. But Lord, we remember that you are a majestic God and it's because you are this majestic God, you are this God that is powerful that we can actually uh, come before you and bow our knees before you, Father. For you are the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named but Lord, we pray that according to your riches and glory that we might be strengthened in our spirit and by the power of your spirit strengthen our inner beings during these days where we might be weary from being apart from community. Help us to be strengthened by your spirit. Strengthen us by the preaching and teaching and study of your word so that we might then taste and see that you are good. Father, I pray that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith, 
that we as individuals here in the United States or in the highlands might be people that are rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. Help us to be able to comprehend with one another what is the breadth and length and height and depth of your love. Help us to know not just in our minds, but also in our experience of life and in our hearts, the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge that we might be filled with the fullness of God. Lord, we pray this to that end for Dornick Free Church, that they might be a church that uh, is united in Christ and that they are bold in their faith. Father, we pray for Dornick Free Church as they are trying to decide whether or not to meet back and in person. Lord, we, we cannot set aside the importance and the value of being able to come together in community to worship. But Lord, we recognize that this is a time where that is not a possibility. But help us to be wise. Give us wisdom and discernment as we try to obey authorities above us, as we try to seek uh, your kingdom and what is best for our hearts and our souls and also for our health and for the love of our neighbors, Lord. I pray that you would grant the leadership of Dornick Free Church wisdom as they discern whether or not uh, and when they can and should meet together. But Lord, I pray for Dornick Free Church, whether they are meeting virtually or whether they are meeting together, Lord, I pray that they again would be rooted and grounded in this love. Lord, we pray that Dornick would be a place that sees the love and the light of Jesus through your church that is there. And Lord, I close asking that you would do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. According to that power that works within us, that that power that works within us would do things with our neighbors, with our friends, with our co-workers that we could never imagine Help them to see and hear the love of Christ through us so that they might in turn taste and see that you are good, that they might come to salvation in Christ through your glory and your grace. So Lord, we sincerely say to you, our majestic God, to you be glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen and amen. Well, boys and girls, it's been a long time since we were able to meet together in person, and I do hope that, if possible, most of you, if not all of you, will be able to join us in the church building here next Sunday. And I hope, too, that you've been listening to at least some of the talks that I've tried to put out online over these past few months. If you are among those who have been listening, then you'll remember that we looked recently at a book, uh, Dr. Doolittle, and the character Push Me, Pull You. And uh, we tried to learn some lessons uh, from that uh, book for ourselves. This morning, the book that I have for you is quite a strange book, because, you know, most books have words or pictures. Uh, But this book that I have with me today doesn't have any words, doesn't have any pictures. And yet it's a book that we can learn a lot of lessons from. And I just want to show it to you now and see what lessons we can learn from it. The book is, as you look at it, not very attractive because it's all black. But you know, the black colour is there for a reason. Because the black colour in this wordless, pictureless book is in order to tell us that The Bible says that in our hearts we are black because of sin and that needs to be dealt with. And then the next colour that we have in the book is red and that is in order to remind us that the Bible says that Jesus went to the cross and poured out his blood for us on the cross in order that he might deal with our sins. And when our sins are dealt with and forgiven, then that means that instead of being black, God now 
tells us that we have been made white in our hearts. The Bible says that though our sins be red as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So the book, The Black Colour, reminding us of our wicked and sinful hearts, the red colour reminding us of the blood of Jesus, and the white reminding us of the fact that when we trust in Jesus, then our sins are taken away. But the book has another two colours in it as well. The fourth colour is green. And that is because the Bible tells us that it's not just enough to come to know Jesus, we are to grow in our knowledge of Jesus. And you will, of course, know Psalm 23, where the psalmist speaks of pastures green. And the Bible does uh, bring us a, a picture of sheep, as it were, uh, grazing on the green pastures. And what it's saying to us is that we have to feed ourselves on God's word in order that we might grow. So we have the black and we have the red and we have the white and we have the green and the fifth colour in this book is gold. Now if you were here I would be asking you of course what all these colours are for but seeing you're not here I might as well tell you. The gold stands for heaven. The Bible speaks of the streets of gold. The Bible speaks of a place that God has gone to prepare for us, that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And the Bible says to us that although by nature we are sinners, if we accept what Jesus has done by pouring out his blood for us, not only will our hearts be made clean, but we will then go on to grow in our knowledge of Jesus and at last we will be found with his people in, on that golden shore and these golden streets that the Bible uses to describe heaven. And so I hope now that you see why this book, without words, without pictures, has so much to teach us. And my prayer for all of us, whether we're children or grown-ups, is that we will be among those who have had our sins taken away by the blood of Jesus and who want to grow up to know him more and more day by day and who will at last go to be with him in the place that he has prepared for us. So may God watch over each one of you and looking forward, as I said before, if you can at all, to come along and be with us here in the church next Sunday morning. Till then, God bless. Lord, we thank you for your, your word and we thank you that we can learn lessons even from a book without any words or pictures. Based on the Bible, we ask that you would truly help us to come and have our sins taken away and that you would help us to feed ourselves on your word and to be sure that at last we will go to be with Jesus in heaven. Bless us all and be with us. For Jesus' sake. Amen.
Luke chapter 6, 37 to 49. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told him a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye, a tree and its fruit. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Build your house on the rock. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it, because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Well, let's turn now to that passage that was read for us in the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, and verses 37 to 49. Over these past uh, few months, as we've been limited to preaching online, we have uh, looked at some parables that Jesus told, and we've tried to ask some pointed questions as we've studied these scriptures together questions as to how things are between us and God. Are we humble before God? Are we rich towards God? Is Christ precious to us? What is our response to the gospel? And other such questions. What we've been trying to do is to show the difference between possibly being religious and being right with God through Jesus Christ. Just before lockdown, in our church services here in Dornoch, we were looking on Sunday mornings at the early chapters of the Gospel of Luke. And as we look forward to coming back to have in-person services, as we call them, again next week, I would like uh, this morning to look with you again at a passage that we were actually looking at here in Dornoch back in February, but a passage that I think sums up what we've been trying to do over these past number of months. A passage where we find Jesus telling us four parables, and each of these raising some very pointed questions that each one of us must answer for ourselves. 
So I want to look at the four parables and at these four pointed questions this morning. The first parable we find in verses 39 and 40. Jesus told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Jesus is there attacking the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees in that they refused to accept that the Old Testament scriptures that they claimed to believe in were talking about him. And they were adding so many rules and regulations that the poor people found it not only difficult but impossible to comply with all that was being required of them. And Jesus is here asking the basic question, who are we following when it comes to the things of God? He is highlighting by the use of the parable here that the scribes and Pharisees, the, those people who were teaching and are still teaching today, that we can make it with God by our own good works, are blind. And that they are, as he calls them elsewhere, blind leaders of the blind. And so he's asking us the question today, as he relates this parable, what about us? Who are we following when it comes to our acceptance of truth? Are we following those who tell us on the one hand that we can make it with God by our own efforts? Or are we following those who would perhaps tell us that there are many ways to God? Or are we following the teaching of Jesus? Are we being led by him? Have we come to him and are we learning of him? You see, Jesus is the, the teacher and we are to accept his teaching as the one who has come from God to bring us to God. Jesus says, this is the way to God. I am the way to God. God says through the prophet, this is the way you walk in it. So he's asking you today and he's asking me, who are you? Who am I following? Because he's saying that the disciple will become like his teacher. So if we are following Jesus, then that will show itself in that in our lives we will be coming more and more the type of people who reflect his character and his conduct. As we're going to be seeing tonight, we're, if we are walking in the light as he is in the light, we are actually ourselves going to be lights in the Lord. And it will become obvious to all who we are following. We're either following Jesus, we're either walking in his footsteps, or we, remaining in our spiritual ignorance, are blind and being led by those who are blind leaders of the blind. So let me ask the question, who are you following? Who am I following today? The second question that arises from the next uh, parable that Jesus tells here is this. Why do we so easily find fault with other people? Jesus says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your own eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your eye. And earlier on in verses 37 and 38, which were read to us, he says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Given and it will be given, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with a measure you use, it will be measured back to you. What's Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying there that you know, if we are uh, adopting the kind of attitude that he's describing here, censorious and critical and looking down on others, then we are being pharisaical. Now, and we are failing to realise 
our own need of having our own sins dealt with. We saw not long ago the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And we saw how the Pharisee was so full of himself and so thankful that he was not like the tax collector. Whereas the tax collector simply called on God to show him mercy. And what Jesus was doing in that parable and what Jesus is doing here is making it clear that we must have our own sins dealt with. We must first of all have our own house in order. If we are to be in any way even of spiritual help to others whom we perceive as having spiritual needs. Jesus is here attacking the notion that many had and still have that they and that perhaps some of us think that we're better than others. We need to have our own sins dealt with. And when we have our own sins dealt with, not only will we see clearly so as to be able to minister in a compassionate, Christ-like way to others who are sinners, but we ourselves will seek to have a forgiving attitude towards others, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. And again, that ties in with what we're looking at in our evening services just now, where Paul exhorts the Ephesians and exhorts us to look to the cross and to realise what we ourselves have been forgiven in order that we might look at others through the eyes of Jesus and have a forgiving rather than a fault-finding attitude towards them. Those who find fault easily with others are only demonstrating that they themselves still have their own sins to be dealt with. And Jesus, in a way, uses a, an illustration that has a, almost a comical aspect to it in order that we might see the absurdity of pointing out the faults of others without having our own faults addressed. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So in a way, he's basically saying the same as in the first parable that we can be so blind to our own faults and that we need to come to the Lord with our own needs and that it is only as we do so that we'll be able, as I've already said, in a Christ-like way to minister to others. So are we finding fault easily with others or are we going to the Lord confessing our own sins and asking that these might be dealt with in order that we might then be able in a way that would be to God's glory and for the good of those whom we might at times be only too ready to criticise and condemn, in order that together we might become lights in the Lord. Again, in tonight's passage in Ephesians, there is reference to how the light not only exposes the darkness, but how the darkness can itself come to share in the light as we make Jesus known. So who are we following? Why do we find fault so easily with others? And the third parable asks the question, what fruit are we producing? For no good tree, he says, bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For fates are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of the evil treasure of his heart, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What fruit are we producing? The Bible makes it clear that there is such a thing as the fruit of the Spirit. And if we are not producing the fruit that is of the Spirit, then we need to ask the question, are we the Lord's at all? By their fruits you shall know them. And if we want to examine what the fruits are, then turn to God's Word as it speaks of loving God, as it speaks of loving one's neighbour, 
as it speaks of loving the lost. Love, joy, content with what God has done for us in Christ, so that more than that is not required and less than that, as another said, would not satisfy. Being at peace with God through the finished work of Christ and knowing the peace of God in our hearts and the God of peace in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, bearing with others, even as God bears with us and gentleness and goodness and faithfulness and meekness and self-control the fruit of the spirit can only be produced when the spirit is present in a person's life no good tree bears bad fruit nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit and he uses another similar illustration where he speaks of good treasure and evil treasure. And what he's really saying is this, it's what we like in our hearts that will be revealed in the way that we live. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we like at heart? The Bible speaks of the importance of being pure of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall, they are the children of God and they shall see God. So we've got to ask, are our hearts right with God? If our hearts are right with God, then that will result in spiritual fruit being born. If our hearts are not right with God, then the fruit of the Spirit will not be found in our lives. So what fruit are we producing? And finally, from the next parable, what foundation are we building on. Why, he says, do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my word and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them, it's like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. The two builders, the two houses, they, they look alike. They, they both seem to be very, very similar in lots of different ways. But there's one way in which they differ from the other. And that is when it comes to the foundation. The man builds a house and he digs deep and he lays the foundation on the rock. Who does that? The wise man does that. The foolish man builds a house but does not lay a foundation. And Jesus explains what he means. He's talking about people who hear God's word. Again, the other week we were looking at the, the parable of the sower and uh, the, the seed fell on the different types of ground, but only one redounded to the glory of God. Here in this parable, he's talking about people who hear. He's not talking about uh, people who hear and people who don't hear God's word. He's talking in both cases about people who hear the word of God. But the difference is this, one hears and does the word. The other hears and does not put the word into practice. And so what Jesus is saying to us is this, we can hear God's word, but unless we accept it, unless we act upon it, unless we appropriate it, then ultimately it will do us no good because we are not building on the right foundation. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the rock on which we are to build. God's word tells us that the wise man built his house upon the rock whilst the foolish man built his house on the sand. What foundation are you building on today? as far as eternity is concerned. Where does your hope lie? Does your hope lie in the fact that your 
righteous, respectable, religious, that you are someone who's familiar with God's word, who, who would be able to quote scripture easily, and who knows at that level what it's all about? Or are you building your hope for eternity on what Christ has done? And on what scripture tells you Christ has done? And are you building your hope on Christ alone? Can you say today, on Christ the solid rock, I stand? And can you say with conviction, all other ground is sinking sand? Jesus is telling us here that there's a day coming when all will be exposed, all will be revealed. The two houses look alike. The two men seem to be very similar in lots of ways in that they're both actively at work building these houses. But the difference lies in the foundation or lack of foundation. And we can be listening to these sermons online and we can be in church next Sunday or any other Sunday and we may all look alike. And may, we may all seem to be identified with God outwardly and going through all the motions and doing all the things that are expected of us. But the question is, are we building on Christ? Is our hope in Christ alone? We often sing it, in Christ alone my hope is found. You make sure that that is true of you because if your hope is not in Christ. If Christ is not your hope, then you're building a house that is one day going to collapse. Make sure today that you are building for eternity on Christ alone. Lord bless these solemn and searching thoughts on your word to us and grant that each one of us might be found this morning among those who are following Jesus, among those who have come to have our own faults, our own sins taken away, and are therefore able in a Christ-like compassionate way to minister to others, grant, Lord, that the fruit of the Spirit might be found in our lives, and grant that we might all be found building for eternity on Christ and his finished work alone. We pray in his name and for the sake of his glory. Amen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's world? For me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued. Amazing Lord, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing Lord, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me?
Now may grace, mercy and peace from Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, rest on and remain with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen.